I think rather you really want to have contact tracing and frequent testing. And I think if you don't have that, um, it's going to be very difficult, if unlikely, to keep colleges free of COVID-19. I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is the July 22nd update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. We've recently switched platforms from YouTube to ON24 to provide our learners with a more interactive platform. For an optimal viewing experience, we recommend expanding your browser window while viewing this presentation. You can expand the media player, which the video plays from, or the slides window to suit your preferences. Please note, polling questions will appear in the slides window. Polling questions will appear shortly, as well as at the end. Please click the box that corresponds to your answer choice and click the submit button. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AAPA credit, as well as AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. To attest for credit, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There you will also find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CE programs on a wide range of topics. The slides for today's webinar and previous webinars can be found under the resource tab. Today's learning objectives are discuss data pertaining to use of tocilizumab in patients with COVID-19, describe data pertaining to the relative efficacy of cloth versus surgical masks to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2, and describe potential effects of low vaccine coverage. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated and in kind by DKB Med. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the activity directors, planning committee members, and faculty presenters and are free of influence from Pfizer Incorporated. In response to a large number of learner questions, we are breaking from our typical format and setting aside this time to solely respond to the most recurrent themes. Answering your questions today is Dr. Paul Allwater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Allwater, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Faith. And certainly, uh, there's always an abundance of questions and uh, always happy to try to answer as many as possible. And you can always feel free to email your questions to qa at dkbmed.com. Okay, we will now move to the listener Q&A. Dr. Allwater, this is our first learner question. Can you provide any information or study review, if any, on the use of cloth face coverings versus surgical masks? Yeah, certainly. So uh, obviously there's been a lot of discussion about no masks versus masks. And the idea, of course, is that masks aren't so much protecting the person wearing them as preventing someone that might not be aware they're infected spreading the virus to others. So here's what we know. And a nice study was recently published on this. Let me go from least to most effective. The least effective covering is what you might see people do with a bandana or they have some kind of nylon or sheer face covering that they'll pull up over their face and nose. They might wear it around their neck. Of course, that's comfortable and so on and so forth. But of course, part of the reason it's comfortable is air is very easily uh, coming out. So if someone's coughing and so on, it isn't nearly as protective as having a cloth covering. However, of the cloth coverings, you really need to have a double cloth covering. So you can't just have a single piece of cloth. You'd like to have a cotton-faced cloth, perhaps on the inside, and then another covering on the other. And again, that's very effective at minimizing spread, meaning you can keep droplets and so on, probably from spreading more than 12 inches or so. The next step would be surgical masks. And then after that, of course, would be something even better, which would be KN95 masks or some of the respirators that you might get at Home Depot without a valve. And then of course you have the medical grade N95 masks, 
which you have to fit test and, and so on. And that's obviously the most, and also the most difficult to wear for prolonged periods of time. So all in all, even a sheer face covering is better than nothing, but uh, really you want a double faced cloth mask and surgical masks are, they're especially not too loosely worn are probably right in the same field. Thank you. Our second learner question. How do we safely reopen colleges without capacity to test and with asymptomatic transmission, even using all the best mitigation techniques? Yes, yeah, so this is obviously a very complicated question, and not only for colleges, but you might also say this is true for elementary and uh, secondary schools. What seems to be successful is if you have relatively low rates of COVID-19 in your community and you can have frequent testing with contact tracing, it's quite possible that you can identify a case and then do contact tracing if you have frequent tests available to capture people that don't know they have it and therefore put them in isolation until they develop an immune response. Now, this really depends not only on contact tracing and the ability to get fast turnaround. Of course, an alternative is to do frequent testing. For example, the White House, they test everybody every day. Even if the test's not perfect, if you're doing frequent testing, you'll probably be picking up asymptomatic shedders more than if you're doing nothing, of course. Now, the issues, of course, are also with social distancing and compliance. And to be honest, I, I don't think we can ask adolescents or young adults to really uh, engage in social distancing on a college campus. Um, uh, there was an experience in Tulane in July that obviously did not go very well with lots of social interactions amongst their students. So I think rather you really want to have contact tracing and frequent testing. And I think if you don't have that, um, it's going to be very difficult, if unlikely, to keep colleges free of COVID-19. And therefore, the more at-risk people, which could be, you know, your older faculty and staff, and if you're having in-person classes, or even staff needing to keep dorms open, cafeterias, and so on. Okay, our next question. I'm a part-time school nurse in Western Pennsylvania. Our parents are going to be able to choose from three patterns for their children's return to school full-time classroom, mixed classroom and virtual, and all virtual. Dr. Allwater, you didn't sound optimistic for the former two selections. What is your advice for someone like me? Yeah, so uh, this uh, sort of, we extend a little bit from our last university college discussion. So you're in Western Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, Pittsburgh, for example, has gone from very few cases to a large number. You know, what is the percent of positive testing in your community? If you're down at one or two percent, rates of community transmission are probably low and hopefully there's a situation where there's contact tracing and frequent testing and fast turnaround so you can identify people. Now, of course, this is what's helped many countries such as Europe, Singapore, Hong Kong, and others keep rates and death rates lower. If rates are high, I would say it's very difficult to say that opening the classroom means you're not going to have transmission. We do know that children in elementary school from a recent Korean study are much less likely to transmit COVID-19 to household members and therefore probably to teachers. That's elementary, so 10 and under. Interestingly, that same Korean study showed for adolescents, teenagers, they are actually more likely to transmit uh, compared to adults. So uh, especially in that uh, scenario, if you can maintain social distancing, you can effectively frequently test or identify and isolate people. It's possible this can go on, but I would think it's only really feasible if you have low community transmission rates. Our next learner question, could HVAC units play a significant role in the acceleration of COVID-19 cases seen this summer in the Sun Belt states? Well, a, a couple of comments here. As far as we know, even though probably the so-called droplet transmission is predominant, there can be small droplets or aerosols that can go further. There is not abundant evidence that HVAC actually can scoop up 
normal kind of droplets and aerosols that people might get from singing or talking and so on, and then scoop them up into their system, uh, have it transmitted through tens of feet of duct work, and then uh, spew out of a different outlet after passing through a filter and so on. Now, people are putting in HEPA filters. There is a nickel foam heated filter to try to render virus negative. It's not clear that this really is playing a role. Uh, of course, if you have a breeze, if you have a fan, if you have uh, a blower from an HVAC blowing across someone that's affected and someone sitting just a couple of feet from you, that could play a role. But I think the questioner here is really asking whether virus can be spread through an HVAC system to other rooms and so on. And so far, there does not seem to be the case, unless if you were to do some kind of experimental high inoculum aerosol generation, which of course really isn't what's happening day to day. Thank you. What is the relationship between the BCG vaccine and risk of COVID-19? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, the BCG vaccine is a vaccine given to children in certain countries with high rates of tuberculosis in effort to help modify their immune responses, even upon exposure to TB and lessen acquisition. Where this sort of came from were some uh, epidemiological studies. I think the first one I saw was back in the spring, perhaps March, where a group looked at people in Spain and Italy and they determined that Italians got COVID much more than Spaniards and died more frequently. In fact, Italy had one of the highest death rates. Now, someone thought, hey, well, uh, the Spaniards gave BCG vaccine for many years. So many of the older people had gotten BCG vaccine in Spain and in Italy they didn't. So is there an association? So there's been an, another larger study more recently that looked at a variety of factors in different countries and suggested perhaps that in countries that use BCG, for every 10% increase of the population that got BCG, there's a 10% reduction in the number of COVID cases and mortality. Now, these are fraught with difficulties because these are epidemiologic studies, they're based on existing data, they're very prone to bias. But it's intriguing enough, I, my understanding is there's two clinical trials in progress to explore if administering BCG in some way is helpful. Now, I will say just from a biologic plausibility standpoint, it seems unlikely. But of course, other things uh, may be uh, true that we just don't understand. So it's, it's a reasonable thing to explore, but I think it's probably due to some biases which we just don't see in these studies. Thank you. Our next question. What is the relationship between the use of proton pump inhibitors and risk of COVID-19? Yeah, so I, I hate to be a cynic, but you know there are many uh, researchers that can't do their work, so they're combing databases to try to find associations. And this kind of data mining might uncover something, but more often than not, really doesn't. And so uh, this grew up out of a study from Cedar sinai that looked at, I think, over 53,000 patients. And they found that if people use proton pump inhibitors, those, so those are medicines like Prilosec to lower stomach acid. If you took it twice a day, you were more at risk for acquiring COVID-19 than people that only took the drug once a day. And it was also more at risk than if you use something like what's called an H2 blocker, which is of course Zantac or Pepsid or something of that nature. Now, this is a retrospective. You could imagine people using uh, proton pump inhibitors twice a day might be heavier. We know obesity is a re risk factor and so on. And so although this came out of a regression analysis, I wouldn't uh, prompt anyone at the moment to change their behavior or stop or start proton pump inhibitors based on these sorts of studies. Okay, thank you. And this question is, what have the studies of tocilizumab and other IL-6 targeted drugs shown? Considering it's used to manage cytokine release syndrome, isn't there some plausibility that it should work for severe COVID illness? By way of just quick background, tocilizumab was advocated back in January and February 
by the Chinese COVID-19 guidelines, which grew out of the experience in Wuhan City, China. And the idea was, of course, that some people seem to be prone to this hyperinflammatory or cytokine storm that really occurs between days seven and 14 of illness. The reason is this drug, tocilizumab, an anti-interleukin-6 receptor blocker, is used in CAR T-cell cytokine release syndrome that's a consequence of immunotherapy for cancers. What's been somewhat disappointing is to date there have been no positive robust positive trials to really suggest that tocilizumab or any other anti-IL-6 targets have been a benefit. So this includes sarilumab, a different monoclonal antibody. So this idea of just lowering IL-6 and really focusing on that as a target, you know, there's mixed data and small studies suggesting benefit, but larger studies really have not shown benefit yet, although there are still trials in progress. So Overall, I'm not overly helpful, and indeed our early use of tocilizumab at Johns Hopkins has dropped off. Of course, what's replaced this is dexamethasone. Uh, we know from the recovery trial at a six milligram per kilogram dose once daily for up to 10 days seems to be very beneficial in patients with severe COVID-19, especially those on ventilators. And this, of course, is much broader in targeting anti-inflammatory actions. So for the moment, I'd say dexamethasone is really the standard of care uh, based on the uh, pragmatic but prospective and randomized trial uh, that is the recovery trial. Our next question is, between background vaccine hesitancy and distrust of the rapid vaccine development program and some myths about COVID, uptake of any approved COVID vaccine may be disappointingly low. What percent of the population needs to be vaccinated to prevent the virus from circulating forever? Yeah, so uh, I'll give you some backgrounds. You know, measles virus is even more contagious than COVID-19 coronavirus. So there, people have often said you need 85 to 90 percent of the population to really get effective herd immunity. For this kind of respiratory infection, a lot of uh, virologists and also modelers suggest you need somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. But, you know, there's some increasing evidence that probably suggests, of course, any herd immunity would probably be helpful for slowing transmission and the number of cases. So, you know, even if you have 20 to 30 percent of the population, wouldn't that be better than having, you know, zero to five, which is where we were starting off, for example, just a couple months ago. So I do think this idea that we have to get 70 percent of the population to have herd, circulating herd immunity may not be possible. Yes, there is vaccine hesitancy, but I do think even if we get numbers into 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent range, that may be very helpful. And don't forget with the flu virus, we don't have 100 percent protection from immunity. We only have partial. So I, I think we're not going to have like a measles type of situation. We'll have something that hopefully will be better than the flu, but probably not as perfect as it is for measles virus. Thank you. Next question. Do we know anything about co-infection of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza? How does co-infection affect outcomes? Yeah, so of course, here we are in the summer when there's not a lot of other respiratory viruses causing illness compared to winter time, for example, with influenza or respiratory syncytial virus. We don't have abundant data, but there were two studies early on in this pandemic, one from China, which uh, look at the Wuhan experience, and they found that 26% of COVID-19 samples were positive for other viruses in a cohort where you look. That included rhinovirus, enterovirus, other coronaviruses, influenza, RSV, a fairly high percentage. Uh, a smaller study done in Northern California out of Stanford, again, uh, during the earliest phases of the pandemic in North America, suggested about 20% of their samples contained other viruses until the respiratory season sort of puttered out in April and so on. Uh, current rates, uh, even at Johns Hopkins, we never had high co-infection rates when we looked, but I think this is going to be very geographically uh, different. This upcoming season, uh, there's no doubt we'll have to look for the big three, 
for anybody with respiratory symptoms, it's influenza, RSV, and SARS coronavirus 2. Okay, next question. Can you comment on the trial of inhaled interferon beta? Yeah, so this is an interesting trial, and we only have a press release data, so I can't tell you too much. But let's step back for a moment. Interferon beta are one of the interferons that are often thought of as antiviral compounds. They sort of jazz up the immune system to fight viruses, and they were interferons were used for chronic hepatitis C, for example, for a long while until better tolerated drugs were found and are still occasionally used for some other viral infections. Uh, a study a few months ago, a phase two study out of Hong Kong, suggested that uh, injected interferon beta uh, was very helpful for decreasing the severity of illness in patients. It wasn't a large study, but uh, many of the physicians in Southeast Asia have adopted interferon beta for uh, patients, especially hospitalized patients earlier in their illness. This particular trial was 101 patients, and according to the press release, uh, it was placebo versus some inhaled interferon, and they uh, claim that people that got the inhaled interferon had a 79% reduction in severe disease, and this was a small study. There were three deaths in the placebo arms, none in the treatment arm, but again, the study was very small. So uh, I, I think this is interesting and encouraging. I, I think inhaling interferon is a question. I guess that if it was well tolerated, you know, often interferon makes people feel crummy when you get it. Also, there's been some prior attempts with inhaled interferon that caused lung reactions that was not commented on in this particular press release. So uh, it, we'll have to wait for the full study. And of course, this begs that it should be uh, used in a larger phase three study to really uh, not only prove efficacy, but look at a larger number of patients for safety. Thank you, Dr. Allwater. As a reminder to claim credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer at dkbmed.com. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. You'll find a range of information, including the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. Again, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Thanks again for your time, Dr. Allwater. Thank you, Faith. And as always, uh, COVID-19 continues to generate many more questions than answers, but uh, as we learn more, hopefully we'll, we'll get ahead of this particular pandemic. Thank you.